Let's pray. Father, it's a blessing to gather in your house this morning, to come and to worship you. Grateful this morning as we begin our series of revival messages to have a renewed emphasis on evangelism and to consider those around us that need to hear the gospel of Jesus. This morning as we enter our time of worship, would you remind us of our need for you each and every day? These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to say a word of welcome to you. It's good to be with you this morning. And if you're a visitor with us, we're excited you're here. And in your bulletin is a tear-off tab you can fill out and drop in the offering boxes located in the uh, foyers. We'd love to get to know you. In your bulletin, there's a whole lot going on, so we're going to kind of rapid fire through this. Hang on with me. Here we go. Um, revival starts now, and then we have services tonight, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. Tuesday during the day is senior lunch at noon. Uh, Kobe Moss will be playing the piano uh, during that. Next Sunday is communion, and next Wednesday we've got a business meeting. Uh, at that business meeting, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and follow up on the plan uh, thing that was talked about at the last business meeting, the strategic plan that was not a proposal for the church, just if you have questions about it, if you're wondering whatever, be a venue for that there, as long with, along with our normal business meeting items. Towards the bottom of the bulletin, we've got poinsettias coming up, we've got... Um, a new church list of names and addresses and things coming out. Shoe boxes are coming up. And um, one more thing not in the bulletin. We started talking a while ago about this opportunity to have an ESL class hosted out of our church. Um, and it's taken forever and a day to find a teacher for that. But we found one, we think. So if that's something you'd be interested in helping with, remember it's one night a week. You can volunteer for as much or as little with it as you want. It could just be open the doors and let them in. It could be baking a snack. It could be as much as even helping teach, kind of facilitate with the, the teacher there. Um, if you're interested in that, it's Tuesday evenings from 5 to 7. And you can see Don Maddox, uh, and he'll get you signed up for that. All right. April's going to come talk about trunk or treat. Good morning, everyone. Just a quick reminder, we're finally in October. So last time we were talking about it, we were a little bit early. Uh, and Carrie wanted to make sure it was October 28th, not September 28th. So um, we've got about four weeks, a little less than four weeks left. So I have the sign-up sheet. It's been out in this foyer. Um, I brought it in. So I'm going to put it here at this small table um, so that you can sign up on your way out if you hadn't had a chance to or forget about it. I know things get busy. so. We have, um, our goal is 20 trunks. We have more room for 20. We have room for more than 20 if um, we are fortunate enough to have more than that. So I've got 12 signed up now. So we still have at least eight more we'd like to fill and we will take as many more as, um, as you would like to. There's also um, tubs outside both foyers for candy donations. If you're able to donate candy, we'll collect that all the way through the month of October. And if you need any help with decorations for your trunk or candy for your trunk other than that, um, just let us know and you can make a note on here. So we appreciate your help and uh, don't forget to sign up. Thanks so much. Let's stand and sing hymn number 295, Revive Us Again.
Our next hymn this morning is um, 428, I Need Thee Every Hour. Take some time this morning and pray together. Um, I'm going to be in prayer for the family of Buck Floyd. And as a reminder, the memorial service is today. Uh, visitation at 2 and then a service at 3. And that's over at Pate Chapel at Thomas Road Baptist Church. I'm going to pray for our pastor search committee as they do their work. And they, you know, it's one of those things they're, they're working behind the scenes and you don't hear a lot about it, but we remember to keep them in prayer. As I said before, we begin revival today and excited to have Dr. Norman Pratt with us. I'm going to let him introduce himself later with whatever he wants you to know. Um, and he says not much. That's okay. But he's going to bring God's word for us this morning. We're going to pray for him as he comes and um, lastly, I'll tell you about our missionary for this week, Mo and Susan Wildly, and they're in Indiana, and they're planting Restore Church International, kind of just outside downtown Indianapolis. One of the areas that they work with is finding people that are struggling with addictions and working to meet some physical needs there and use it as an opportunity uh, to share the gospel. And uh, we want to pray for them as they do their work outside Indianapolis. Let's take all these things to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's an honor to be able to come to you in times of grief and times of joy. We know you hear us. We pray for the missionary that we talk, spoke of in Indiana and ask that you give them opportunities to share the gospel there. Pray today for our services in the same vein as we consider the church and how we can live as a salt and light in the world, how we take your gospel into the world. Pray for Dr. Pratt as he comes to speak, that you would fill him with your spirit in a special way, that he would illuminate the scriptures, that we would receive the message for today. Ask whatever we hear, whatever we take away would be from your word and that we would ingest it. And it would stick with us and change us. 
These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Good morning. Well, we've got quite a few awake this morning. Usually it's one or two, but today we have four or five. That's good. Well, my name is Norm Pratt. My name is Norman, but they call me Norm for short, you know. And so be careful how you use that word short around me. I appreciate it very much. When I was in the Air Force, I was a chaplain in the Air Force for 18 years. And one, one uh, Saturday, um, the commander said to me, said, said, uh, he called me, uh, he, he called me Padre. He said, Padre, he said, I want you to go down to the picnic with me. We had a, a wing picnic for our, we had 1,400 members in our wing. Go down to the picnic with me and I want you to lead, lead in a short prayer. I said, sir, I said, I appreciate it if you wouldn't use that word short. So, uh, so that was in his office. He went down to the wing picnic and there was a low boy there where they had all the sound system set up. You know what a low boy is? That's what you hold the big uh, front end loaders on. And uh, so he got up there to the microphone and he said, now I've asked the chaplain to lead us in a brief prayer. So uh, I, I said, that's not what he said in the office. So I went up to the microphone and I said, that's not what he said in the office. So I, I, told, I told what he said in the office and he changed it from short to brief. And uh, so I was always unpredictable. He didn't know what I was going to say. So that was, that was a, a time where he never called me short again after I told on him. So anyhow, I, I, I usually do a survey first thing when I go to a church. Uh, and and usually I, in in my message you'll know I'll, I'll I'll relay some things to you that to where I don't need to do it in an introduction it'll it'll be throughout the sermon because I want to tell you about what God has taught me over the years I say September 28 1969 so it's been a learning experience to say the least so I usually do a survey when I go into a church and I'm trying to figure out how many people are hunters in the churches. They used to be, I was thinking if it was 1822, everybody would be a hunter. But um, I'm not talking about the name. I'm talking about how, how many folks in here are hunters. Uh, let's see how many we got here. There's one, two, three, four, five that admit it. And how, many are, how many are deer hunters? There's one back there. I see that. That's a high hand back there in the, in the sound booth. So we got one two, three, four. So, uh, I, so I got you. So uh, I have good peripheral vision. You, you learn to watch everybody whenever you're preaching. I mean, I can see this door over here. I, 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 uh, I get off on the side, side road sometimes, so you have to get me back on, tell me where I was, especially when it comes to time. I'll, I'll talk about 2 o'clock in the morning, so you remind me when it, when it was. So uh, there's a... What I'm going to tell something about two o'clock in the morning. So anyhow, um, there was a uh, there was a uh, a pastor, a Baptist pastor, as a matter of fact, and a lawyer and a doctor. They decided that they were going to go deer hunting. So have you heard this? They uh, they went out and made preparations. And the way you make preparations is you go find a deer run. That, that's where they go back and forth. The same. They're OCD like me, doing the same thing all the time. You can tell where they've been and where they're going. And you can, their footprints, they leave their footprints in the soft soil, and you can see where they've been. They found the deer run, they put up what's called a, a blind, a deer blind. And what the deer, a deer blind is, that you get behind it, you build something and get behind it. I don't know exactly how you do it because I'm not a deer hunter. But um, you build a blind and you get behind it to where you become blind to the deer. And so they built that blind, and they were down behind it, and they were waiting. And around the corner, there was this straightaway. Uh, so, so this big buck came around the corner and headed down the straightaway. And they all had their weapons ready. If you had been in the military, you don't call them guns. It's a weapon. All three had a, had a high-powered rifle. And uh, so they had them trained on that, on that buck, and everybody pulled the trigger at exactly the same second. Maybe millisecond. I mean, it was so close you couldn't hear but one report. Three weapons went off at the same time. One report, so you could hear. Everybody shot at the same time. So, so the lawyer went running out. He said, let me see who, who hit the deer. Said, uh, he went out and he bent down over the deer, grabbed that big rack and turned him over and back and forth and looked at it. He said, said, I can't determine it. He said, this is one for the doctor. So the doctor, he went running out and he bent down over the, uh, 
He went down over the deer and turned it over this way and looked on this side and looked on that side of his head. And he said, the only one person could have killed this deer. He said, it had to be the Baptist pastor. He said, it went in one ear and came right out the other. <laughs> so, um, now notice I, I'm an evangelist. I'm not a pastor. So, uh, so whenever, whatever I'm, what I'm going to say this morning is very important. I said that to say this. I do have a point. The point is, uh, probably, probably the only, maybe the only message you've ever heard from Luke chapter 11. I know I've only heard one, and it was within the last few years. And I've been, I've been studying this for a long time. So, so if you want to get something, if you want to get something out of this, please don't let it go through in one ear and out the other. So I'm, I'm hoping we can keep it in the brain matter this morning. And the, um, the scripture is Luke chapter 11, and I call it the parable of the friend at midnight. The parable of the friend at midnight. Reading in verse 1, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And going down to verse 5, because we have, we have two lessons on prayer in response to this uh, request. The request was, Lord, teach us to pray. And there's two lessons on prayer. The first one is what I call the model prayer. It's in verse 2 through 4. And then the midnight prayer is in verses 5 and following. You can read on down through there and find about where, about where it, it ends in verse 13. And uh, so reading in verse 5, And he said unto them, in response to that request, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is come in his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and, and, I, and, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Verse 8, I say unto you, though he will rise, and not, they, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, I'm using the King James, you can tell, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck on that. I got saved. I heard the word of God from the King James. I got saved under a preacher who was preaching the King James, and I've been memorizing the King James since September 28, 1969. Because of his importunity, it means persistence. He will rise. He will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And we will not have time to cover. Point number three that I have on the outline. By the way, I just want to double check. You should have three things. You should have in your hand, Lord willing, you should have uh, the message I'm going to an outline of the message I want to preach because I want to, I want to, I want you, I want it to stay in there. I don't want it to go, go through one ear and out the other. So, so here's the content. I will not be be able to cover point three, which is on, uh, which is on uh, the. Uh, the back of the page. There's two pages, front and back. One on the front, front and one on the back. I will not be able to cover that second page. That's why I put so much in there. I, I researched it and, and narrowed it down and edited it and narrowed it down. And it's really enough to write a book there in, on page two. We will not be able to cover that. So i so, uh, just tell you that. So, so uh, points one and two are what we're going to cover this morning. And... Um, and just by way of review, just for a second, we have in, in verse 1 that somebody was praying in a certain place. Somebody had a, habit, habit, had a habit of praying in a certain place. And those certain places were places that, where he had visited and where he, where he would go around in his ministry. And there were certain places that he had picked out where he just loved to pray. And, you, and if you're a praying person, you'll find out that there are certain places that, that, that just call you to prayer, certain places where you love to pray, and certain places where you feel it's special. It's a special place. And, uh, and, and the Bible calls it your closet. I mean, you might have a closet, but you can make a closet anywhere as far as that goes. And so he was praying in a certain place when he ceased one of his disciples said unto him. Now, just picture this. They had, the disciples were following the Lord in his ministry as he went throughout the countryside and, and he performed the miracles and he raised the dead and he, he, he broke the bread and he walked on water and he spoke to the, 
to the waves and the wind, and they ceased. And he all of the, and, and he did all of these miraculous miracles. And so, as the disciples were in the camp that night after they had ministered all day and they were tired, uh, about a certain time in the morning, maybe two o'clock in the morning, uh, somebody went slipping out of the camp uh, and and hit a pebble, probably on purpose, if I was guessing, probably hit a pebble with their foot and woke the disciples up. And they said, there he goes again, you know. And so they went following out. They said, what's he doing out there? So they went out following him. And um, and as they went out, they heard him out there. And he was in he was in deep prayer. And they got behind the bush as if you could hide from God. They got behind the bush and they were there at, while he prayed. And, and, and when he finished, when he ceased, that they went running to him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, they didn't, they didn't say, Lord, teach us to perform miracles. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to raise the dead. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to walk on the water. They, they did not say that the great things that they had seen, the miracles that they had seen. They didn't, they, they didn't want to participate in that. What impressed them was his prayer life. They had never seen in their lives communion with the Father such as Jesus had. They had never seen anything like that. And it so impressed them, they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples, that is, personally. So in direct response to that, the Lord gives two lessons on prayer. The first one is the model prayer. The second one is the midnight prayer. And the midnight prayer begins with, we, we can, let me just give you a proposition on this first. My, prop, my proposition is that God wants to encourage us to pray. God wants to encourage us to pray. I'm here this morning as an encourager. I come this morning as an, as an encourager, encouraging us to pray. Now, we can encourage to pray if, if we personalize and we pursue these, these encouragements because the Lord gives encouragements to pray. Now, now the reason he gives encouragements, it, it, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, they did not say, teach us how to pray. We know how to pray. They didn't say, teach us how to pray, but we don't pray. So they, this, was, this is encouragements to pray. Whenever you misunderstand what's happening, you won't pray. If, if you think God is against you, you won't pray. There's a lot of reasons you won't pray. But we don't pray. And so he gives us these encouragements. Encouragement number one on your outline is he encourages us through three crisis circumstances that, that are really just preparations. They prepare us to pray. There are things happening in your life. And... Um, and, and as, there's, I, I, I divided it down into three sections. There's a, I always go backwards. And the preparation number three is the provisional crisis. When the times in your life come when you say, I have nothing, and you identify with this, with this midnight prayer, I have nothing. There was a friend come to him at midnight, and he said, I have nothing. I, my, my cupboard is empty. Um, in our world today, that, that's a common thing. A lot of cupboards empty today, and uh, a lot of people are in dire circumstances whenever it comes to provisional crisis. And so that, that's, a, that's a circumstance that prepares us for prayer. It tells us that, that we are not in control, but God is in control, and I can seek Him for my provisions. And then the second, the, the second is the people in crisis. There are people, people all around us who are in crisis, and, and uh, I call that our a prayer DNA circle. And so you have people that you know that are in your circle of influence, your circle of people, of people that, that, that you're acquainted with, you know them uh, closely, and there's things happening in their life, and there's the things happening in their life, and you hear about it, then you hear about it for one reason, and that is that you might learn to pray for them, that you might lift them up in prayer. It is not that you might gossip. It is not that you might say, did you hear about what happened here or happened there? No, it is so that you might pray. So, so the Lord wants us to discern about the people in crisis around us. And then, uh, this is the one I want to talk about a little more in depth. There is the midnight time. It was midnight. And so that's the personal crisis time. That's the times when, that's the times when you... You have a crisis going on in your life. It is midnight. It is the last hour of the day. You've worked and you've toiled and you've done everything you know to do to solve the problem. You've outlined, you've engineered, you thought. And the psalmist said, you have come to wit's end corner. Wit's end corner. You're in a corner. You can't figure it out. And so God says, when you come to that time, 
That is the time that you learn to pray. That is, God is preparing you for prayer. And so, um, so that, that God begins that in our life way before we're ever saved. He begins to work in our life with, with uh, you have to believe in the sovereignty of God. You have to believe that God, that God works in our lives in sovereign ways so that he literally arranges the circumstances. He arranges all the circumstances so that he might get our attention so that we might look to him. That's his purpose. And so the midnight times in our lives, that happened to me before I was ever saved. I was working in a new three-bay shell service station. I had gone to shell management school down in Knoxville, Tennessee. I was raised in East Tennessee. And my, boss, uh, my boss was going down to Florida to start a new service station, and he wanted me to be the manager. I'd worked with him since high school, uh, working in the, in the uh, everything in the, to do with the service station, and started out in the in a wash rack 12 hours a day, six days a week, $65 a week. So how would the minimal, minimal hour uh, work on that? <laughs> and, and, uh, and so anyhow, um, anyhow, I finished that and we, we were opening a new service station in, Sh in Hollywood, Florida. So, uh, so I was working down there and I got a telephone call from my mother and she said, Norm, she said, you have a personal invitation personal letter from the President of the United States. This was, this was 1966. You have a personal letter from the President of the United States. I said, oh, I do. She said, yeah. It reads like this. Dear Norm, you have to report to the induction center on Knoxville, Tennessee at such and such a time, such and such a place. I got on my thumb and I hitchhiked back to Tennessee from Hollywood, Florida. And uh, then I went, stayed home for a while and went down to the induction center in Knoxville, Tennessee. I stood before the induction, induction center and I said, I will defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. They said, you are now Private E-1 Norman Pratt. And I had been drafted into the United States Army. After, after going to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky for basic training, going to Fort, Fort, uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia for, for additional training, and, and I was in Fort Dix, New Jersey for more training. Orders were cut after that for the other side of the world. Then it was South Vietnam. I got on a plane and went to, went to California and there uh, dodged the, uh, dodged the, uh, the KP police, the people that were running everybody down to try to get them to, to do a kitchen police. Dodged them for a few days and then I got on another plane and we went to a place called Hawaii. Man, that was great. Went touched down in Hawaii and I said, man, I love this. And while, while they refueled the plane, and I said, I shall return. I was like MacArthur. <clears throat> and so I got on that plane, and then we went down over Southeast Asia. And as we came down, they were decompressing the plane. And you could have to hold your nose. I mean, Vietnam smelled so bad. The tropical heat accentuated the fact that there was no running water and no bathrooms, no sanitation system. You had to hold your nose. It smelled bad. So I went, went in to Tonsonut Air Base in the south. Then we moved to Cameron Bay. And then we moved to a place called... Quignon. And then I had one more move, and it was at Chulai. Chulai was a marine air base where they were bombing the north and big bomb, bomb dumps everywhere, and the Marines were there. And we went in to relieve the Marines while they moved further north. So I was working, I was working in a communications center as a communications sergeant, radio teletype, and Morse code. And I was working one morning about 2 o'clock. And I remember just doing my job, and all of a sudden, I mean, boom, everything exploded. I mean, that was the morning of Tet. Yeah, if you don't know about it, you have to look it up in history. I mean, there, there are actually a lot of people who don't even know about it now. <laughs> it's hard to believe that I'm that old. But uh, people who are young have never heard of it. And so they, they, they were bombing us from the mountains with the, with the uh, 120 millimeter rockets, and they scored direct hits on our bomb dumps. The bomb dumps all exploded together. A concussion blew our company area completely away. And I, when, I, when daylight came, they were running around gathering everybody up, trying to. And we had to evacuate our part of the base. We had a, we had a uh, an artillery dump right over from us, and they said it's hot and it's going to explode and we're going to self-destruct. We got to get out of here. We went down through the Constantino wire down to the South China Sea, right beside, right beside where where our base was. We go right, went down down to the South China Sea to, to it. They said, now find a sand dune and hide behind it. I said, gladly. I had one goal, and that was to make it back home. And so I got, got behind that sand dune, and I was laying there that morning, 
And I prayed for the first time in my life. I, I still remember exactly what I prayed. Psychologists will tell you you remember during the, during the pressured times of your life. You remember everything distinctly. I remember distinctly. I prayed behind that sand, sand dune. I said, God, if you'll let me get out of this mess, I'll live for you. Now, I didn't know that God had, God had stenographic angels writing down vows. I, I learned that in seminary later. And so I made it back home after several more mortar attacks and rocket attacks. My wife and I set up housekeeping at 1636 Pleasant Avenue. And a um, little two-bedroom two house built in World War II in Bordenwell Village. Right, houses right next to each other. And I decided I was going to make something out of my life. And I was going to East Tennessee State University today to be a, a football coach and a teacher. I wanted to be a football coach like my football coach was. He was... He impressed me, and I wanted to be just like him. I was studying to be a, a coach and a teacher. And so, um, so I came home one... I was working during the daytime at Kingsport Press, the largest book manufacturer in the world. And I, I was in a five-year training program learning how to be an estimator and a builder. And so, um, so I came home one night after a night school, drove my 51 Chevrolet truck down the alley and ran into the garage behind my house. Then I walked in the back door of my house, the kitchen, and when I walked in the back door of my house, my wife was sitting on the couch in the living room, just a little living room there with. I was talking to her about it the other day, that, all that green furniture and maple, maple wood all over it. And so uh, she was sitting there with a big smile on her face, and that certainly was different. I mean, my wife and I were married very young, and we had a lot of problems. I mean, I mean she had knocked me down, and I just dragged myself out. And so... Uh, she was sitting there with this big smile on her face, and I said, well, what's going on? I mean, I knew something was wrong. You can tell by the atmosphere, differences in the atmosphere, right? And, and that big smile on her face. She said, well, the, pre the neighbors heard her knock down drag outs, and she said, they sent their preacher over, and she said, I got saved tonight. And she said, she said words that she'll always regret. She said, and I want you to get saved, too. She's regretted that ever since. Just kidding, of course. Some people take me serious on that. But... Uh, but she said, I want you to get saved too. I said, that's okay for you, but not for me. And I went back and out the back door. And uh, she said, well, the preacher's going to come and see you. I said, that's okay, because I'd gone to Lee's McRae Junior College in North Carolina to play football. And it was a Presbyterian school, and they made, you had to take Bible. And I made an A in the Bible. I mean, it was great. I, I loved the Bible. and I was unsaved, but I loved it. Made an A in it. Everything else, I failed. I mean, I didn't even go to class. So I, I went one semester. So, um, so Saturday came, I worked half a day at the Kingsport Press, we were covered up, had to work uh, my regular shift plus half a day Saturday, came home and I was sitting there in the, in the living room watching a September football game on a black and white TV. I know it's hard for some people, the young people to, to relate to a black and, black and white TV, <laughs> but, but I was reading, I was watching that, TV, that, that ball game and there was, this, there, was this, there was this knock at the front door. And I went to the front door, opened the front door, and I, I was looking out there, and I looked up like this, and there was this great big tall guy, totally white hair, a lot of hair, and it looked like he had a child back in his jaw. I mean, East Tennessee, that's what everybody chews. And so uh, I found out later, his daughter told me that he put a whole pack of chewing gum in his mouth at one time. He was a chewing gum freak. So he said, he said, he said I guess you know who I am. I said, yes, sir. And it was L.C. Collins, Pastor L.C. Collins from Springdale Baptist Church in Kingsport, Tennessee. So I, I said, yes, sir, come on in. I had never talked to a preacher before. Never had, wouldn't have anything to do with anything that had to do with the reality of life and death. Wouldn't go to a funeral home. Uh, wouldn't go to a church. So Pastor Collins came in. He sat down in my living room. And he looked me eyeball to eyeball and nose to nose. And he said to me, Norm, God loves you. And I'd never heard that before. He said, God loves you. I mean, there's a church on every corner in East Tennessee, but I never heard that God loved me. Um, and he went into detail, sat there on, with a big smile on his face and tears coming out of his eyes. He told me, he told me how God loved me. He went into detail with a word picture of the sufferings of Jesus, how he loved me, how he suffered and bled and died for me, how they drove the nails into his hands, how they beat him, those strong Medician soldiers, until his visage was so marred that he didn't even look like a man, how they put the cat and nine tails to his back and took the flesh from the bones, and how they put, put the nails in his hands and the crown upon his head, and they put him upon an old rugged cross and crucified him. For me, he said, Norm, he loved you. God loves you. 
And then they, he was putting me in a bar to him, and, and he arose the third day, and he told me that's the gospel. He said, Norm, that's the gospel. God loves you. And then in, in just a few minutes, he said, I think you're about ready. I mean, he was a very wise person. He could tell what was going on, that God was at work in my life. And I, he said, Norm, I think you're about ready. Well, I lied. I said, no, I'm not, but I was. And so he was very wise. He backed off, and he said, I just want you to bring Linda to church tomorrow. That's my wife. And so I made my first mistake. I agreed to bring my wife to church the next morning. So we got up on Sunday morning, and Linda and I had an argument. She went in the bedroom and locked the door, and I couldn't get in. I'd always been a person of my word, and so I had to keep my word to Preacher Collins. So, uh, so I had to give in, and we solved that, and we followed our neighbor, Sid and Eva Darnell, to church at Springdale Baptist Church. Well, when we got to church, I, uh, everything's okay now. Uh, when, when we got to church, I went in. I had time to do that. I had time to 
do that. Mark should be for repentance. So that morning, when he gave me the invitation, I took a little bit by the hand, and we, we came out of the aisle, and we joined Springdale Baptist Church, and then, then there was a the Baptist Church first. I said, he baptized, preached and baptized me first. He was so proud of my body. Mm -hmm. He baptized my wife, and I had to be at church and a pastor. Never had anything like that before. And, and when we started coming to church, I went to sit right here on the front row. But Linda went to sit back there further. So, so we went back and forth with that, and he ended up sitting back here. But we had what's called popcorn testimony. You know what that is? You know what popcorn does? It just pop, pops up, right? We had popcorn testimony. We just pop up and testify. And, uh, and I did a whole lot of popcorn and testifying, and everybody's saying, when are you going to. <laughs> When you go in, you call the preacher. It wasn't long until he got, got bad. I couldn't stand it. Told my wife. And she had a hard time with it, so I had, I had to learn to pray. And so I was studying like the Jack Hobbs and John R. Rice and some of these guys who were prayer warriors. And I learned to fast and pray from these guys. And I fasted and prayed. And we had a little bathroom where we lived on Blessing Avenue. And I'd go in that bathroom and lock the door and wash the floor. In my tears. One night, we went to a Wednesday night prayer service at our church. And the uh, pastor said, uh, you know, he had a guest preacher. 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 He had a guest First time he said it, he said, I want you to clean all the front rows out. <laughs> this was a Wednesday night, and the church was absolutely packed. I don't know where everybody went was on the front row, but the front row, there's nobody there. He said, God's going to fill the front row tonight. Sure enough, I can think of him. I can think of the priest. <clears throat> the aisles were full coming down. And I looked up, my wife was sitting. I think she must have been saying different location, but I looked up and I started with my wife. And, I, and, I, and I, she told me, she said, God just spoke to me and she said, she said I'll, do, I'll do the best I can. So we headed out on our journey in the ministry. And uh, and and so I started preaching. So they had to preach my first sermon at Springfield Baptist Church. And the church was full because there was a place called Long Island. And it's the church. And I'm, down the host river. And and in Long Island, famous for moonshine, I knew everybody in the island. And it's just like Newport, Tennessee, famous for moonshine. Everybody knows it in Tennessee. And so during the first day I was saved, I went down to, to Long Island and I saw the area door down there. Some of them got this for me. And I got called to preach and they all came over to me to preach. The second term I preached, I went to a place called Green Village Baptist Church. And when I went up up here to, to, to preach, I looked up there, right there. There was a prayer, there was a prayer uh, list. And I read this name and that name, and right down the list there I read my name. The whole time I was praying in Vietnam, behind that sand dune, this church was praying for me. And so uh, that, that's, that's, that, that's covered on the, on the last page, on the second page of your outline, how that prayer works how prayer works in a cycle. And, and it's, it's, it's like, like Cornelius was praying in Acts chapter 10. It's a long chapter, can't go through it. But Cornelius was praying, and, uh, and over on the other side of town, Peter was praying on top of the house. And then in heaven, God was directing all this. God, Peter was unsaved. Uh, Cornelius was unsaved, pardon me. And, and, and all his prayers were going up. It was, it's like, a, it's like a, and God was directing all the prayers that were coming up to him. But then God sent a message back down to Peter. He said, he said, Cornelius is over praying. It's not exactly like this. But he said, Cornelius is over praying on the other side of town. I want you to go over and tell him about Jesus. And he did. And he went over and preached the gospel to Cornelius. And Cornelius and his household got saved. And, and the gospel, he was a Gentile. The gospel went to the Gentiles. And you and I are here tonight because Peter obeyed God and preached the gospel at the house of Cornelius. And so, um, so that's the way I got started. That's, that's the way I got started, that God was, God was working in my life in a very special way. And 
in the first days, in the first days, uh, I, I wanted to, I wanted to learn about the Bible, and and so we went to, to Hammond, Indiana, to go to school up there. And Linda said, "No, I don't want to go up there." And so we came back, and the next place we went to was Lynchburg, Virginia. And I was in the first graduating class of Liberty University. Uh, while I was at Liberty University, there was a guy by the name of J. O. Grooms, who was in director of soul winning for the church. And, and he was also a professor in the early days of the college. And he wrote a book called Treasure Path, and that's how this Treasure Path comes into this. And, and I, I, began, I began working with J.O., just volunteer, and we would go out every day soul winning. And, and he would teach this in class, this book. And I've, I've memorized this book several times. Then he wrote other books. And, and it, it was in this book, it was in this book, that, that I learned the Word of God in, in, in the very early days. And these, it's all scripture. It's a scripture memory program, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's arranged by subject. And, uh, and there's like, like lessons in here, and in the back there's a plan of salvation. Well, um, so, the, so those are the circumstances that prepare us for revival of prayer. And then he encourages us through, the, there's not only there's three circumstances, there's two conditions that prevail in a revival of prayer. And that, that, uh, that first condition is found, it's found in verse seven and eight. We're, con we're confronted with these two prevailing conditions. And, and the, the first one is the law of purity. He says he will not rise and give him simply because he's his friend. I mean, just simply because you're saved doesn't mean God's gonna answer your prayer. I mean, God will give you bread. You don't even have to pray for bread. But just simply because you, and the old timers, called it praying through. And this is, this is called the law of purity. He will, not, he will not rise and give him simply because he is his friend. There, there, are, there are things mentioned in the Bible, and I have several of them mentioned here, about this law of purity. And it's, um, it's unfulfilled, marriage, unfulfilled marriage vows. And he, and he says if we don't live together in a proper way, in a proper biblical way in our marriage, that their prayers will be hindered. That's in in, in First Peter three, and then there's unreconciled wrongs. He said, when you come to pray, you come down to pray. He says, and you got a gift. Leave the gift at the altar, and then go and be reconciled. That's that's the horizontal relationships that we have with other people. Go be reconciled to your brother, and then come back and I'll hear your prayer. And then there's unforgiving bitterness. He said, if you've got bitterness in and you won't forgive other people, then the Bible says, neither God will God forgive you. And I don't know what that means, really. Because you are forgiven if you're saved. And then there's, there's unpaid tithes. There's the, uh, there's, the, uh, there's the question, will a man rob God? And he says, yes, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Then there's unconfessed sin. If I regard, if I hold on to sin in my life, then the Lord will not hear me. It's not that he can't hear me. He won't. He's saying, if you want to hold on to sin, that's fine. You hold on to it. But I'm not going to answer your prayers. And then there's the unread Bible. He that turns away from hearing, turns away his ear from the hearing of the Word of God. The Bible says his prayer shall be an abomination. Do you know what an abomination is? Well, let's just say it's back in July and August, uh, and you hear a terrible noise down on the highway. And uh, you wonder what it is. And somebody says, well, it was, uh, it, it was an animal got hit on the road. And that, so it, it lays there and lays there and lays there in several, several days and goes into a week or maybe two weeks, but at least a week. And uh, you say, well, I'm going to go down and see what that was. Check it out. And so uh, you go down and check it out and you bend down to look at it. And when you bend down to look at it and you bend down over it, there's something coming up from it. It's called an abomination. It's a terrible stench. And when it hits your nose, you want to you fly backwards. And the, the Bible says, if, if our Bible is unread, we turn our, away from hearing of the, of the Word of God, then our prayer is an abomination. So then the law of persistence is required. He says, because of his importunity, his persistence, if you won't quit... How many, how many folks do you know just quit? How many folks have you quit on? When you first got saved, you had what's known as the first love. You loved the Lord, and you loved, you loved those in your family who, who, uh, 
who didn't know the Lord. And the fir first thing you did was you created this list and you, in your mind or on paper or somewhere. And, and you began to pray for them and you began to witness. And maybe you didn't witness, maybe you just prayed. Some people don't witness. Although the Bible says, you shall be witnesses unto me. And, and, so, and, and, and you did that for a while and then all of a sudden, with time, it just dropped off, right? And if, and if, we, uh, and if we went and, and took all the things that we've given up on in prayer, and we started that door, and we unrolled a scroll all the way up to here. It would be a long list of things we've given up on. And so, the law of persistence is required if God's going to hear your prayer. I mean, it's not, not that God can't hear. It's just that we, we need to straighten out some things. So let me say to you this morning, as we're here, and, and, um, and, we, and we look at these, at these, at these uh, Lord, teach me to pray. God wants to teach us to pray. And, and, and I, I have, this, have this one thing. That's, pers that's a mercy on personal prayer, a revival of prayer. And uh, what I want to do is give our invitation, and then after the invitation, I'm going to tell you about the treasure box. I'm going to take about five minutes and tell you about the treasure box, if Pastor Brian allowed me to do that. And so, so it's, t it's the invitation time. That means that I've delivered the message that God wanted me to deliver, that, that Jesus encourages us to pray, and he, he encourages us through three crisis circumstances, and he encourages us uh, that there are that, that there are conditions to this this prayer revival of prayer, and those two conditions of the law of purity and the law of persistence. And let me just ask you, where do you fit in in that message this morning? I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. This is what I want to say. There are all kind of folks here this morning. Nobody knows your heart but you and God. And uh, the one thing, well, the one thing that's the most important thing in the world is that you, if you die today, you know for sure you're going to heaven. And let me ask you this: if you know for sure that you're going to heaven, you've been saved, you've been born again, and you know it, and you're not ashamed of it, would you slip your hand right up and right back down, back down with me? You don't. Nobody's looking but me, me and the Lord. God bless you and thank you. Now, some of you didn't raise your hand. Maybe you didn't understand, or maybe you haven't been saved. But you're honest, and you believe God does answer prayer, and that you would say, pray for me. Pray for me. I'm not saved, or I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you slip your hand right up and right back down so I can pray for you? I will not embarrass you. I will not.